What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com, H-A-W-G Sports.com. A big matchup for the Arkansas Razorbacks and the Florida Gators in Gainesville this weekend. We're going to talk to Jacob Rudner over at Swamp 24-7, help us get a little more insight on the Florida Gators, and Curtis Wilkerson is going to join us as well, maybe talk a little bit of basketball too. All that and more on today's episode of Hog Sports Live. There's so many ways to watch and listen to this show, and your old grandpa, your pappy, he doesn't have a he doesn't have an iPhone, he doesn't know about the show. He's a big Razorback fan, and you haven't even told him yet. Hand him your phone, let him watch the show. Tell your dad, tell your friends, tell everybody. If you're enjoying the show, chances are they would too if they're a Razorback fan. So they can watch on Facebook Live where we're always streaming live. They can watch on YouTube where we upload immediately after. Give us a thumbs up or a like on both of those channels. Be sure to follow the Facebook page and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And also take a moment and hit the notifications bell so you're alerted anytime we upload new videos on YouTube. Throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you haven't taken a moment to do that. We're almost up to 1,000 reviews um, or ratings, excuse me. So uh, we'd love to have that from you. Also available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, anywhere else podcasts are found. We are there. Hog Sports is just $1 right now for your first month at hawgsports.com. And it's an important time to sign up because transfer portal windows coming. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Recruiting, big recruiting period coming up. And, uh, of course, Razorback basketball. And as we know, looks like they got a pretty good squad. And an important time for football as well. Very important time for football. Because this Florida game, I mean, Florida's 5-3 and three right now, 3-2 and two in the SEC. And you look at what they've got coming up. We talk about Sam Pittman and the importance of this month for him. What about Billy Napier? I mean, he's not exactly a fan favorite right now. He's trying to get the program built back up. After this game against Arkansas, which, by the way, Arkansas is still plus six and a half, so six and a half point underdogs on the Bet Saracen app. And the over under is 50.5. I think that might have moved a little bit, actually. But no, excuse me, five and a half. It's dropped down to five and a half. So Arkansas plus five and a half now on the Bet Saracen app. So, um, Looks like some money coming in on the Razorbacks on that one. So that line has moved six and a half earlier in the week. Now for Florida, they have, after Arkansas, they have, they go to Baton Rouge to face number 13 LSU. They go to Columbia, Missouri to face number 14 Missouri. And then they welcome Florida State, number four Florida State, undefeated Florida State in, in, in Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville. I mean, this is a chance for them to get bowl eligible, and that's three games that are going to be tough. Two road games against ranked teams and a home game against the number four ranked team in the country. This is as big a must-win game for Billy Napier as it is for Sam Pittman in a lot of ways. Something to think about. Huge game. Will Arkansas have Rocket Sanders back? That's a big question. And if they do get him back, how involved will he be? Will it be like a eight rushes game, getting him back involved kind of thing, or will it be throwing him out there and letting him get 15, 20 carries and some catches and stuff? We don't know. But we do know he's been practicing. Basically what Sam Pittman says, you can trust Sam Pittman on a lot of things. You can't trust him on injury stuff. He's just not going to be forthcoming, you know. And you can't really blame him. I mean, other coaches aren't going to be that. I wish the NCAA would start implementing, the more we get to a pro model, uh, start implementing rules that you have to disclose injury information. That would make things a lot easier. It would be reasons to open up practices, all those kinds of things. But uh, practice has been closed this week. We don't know exactly what Rocket Sanders has been able to do. He could be out there jogging, for all we know, and or walking around, <laughs> walking from drill to drill. We don't know exactly what he's been doing, but uh, Pittman says he basically needs to continue. Uh, last time we spoke with him was Wednesday, so today's practice is Thursday, and Friday needs to be able to continue these next couple of days the way that he's been doing on Monday, Tuesday practices, and we should see him Saturday. Uh, Devon Manuel, I think that's a big thing with the stinger. You know, I think of a stinger, I think like – Back when I was playing, like you hit your, you know, lower your head because we didn't play heads up football then. You lower your head and you get a kind of a, like a little stinger right there in your neck. But it always seemed like, you know, that would kind of go away after a little while. But Devon Manuel has like played him since fall camp. And this was a guy they felt like may, maybe their second best offensive lineman as only a one year starter. So pretty big deal for Devon Manuel. 
always, I forgot to check the audio, make sure everything's working well. Hopefully it is. So uh, Dwight McLaughlin, I think, is an interesting situation because he was supposedly healthy against Mississippi State but just didn't play. Coach's decision just wasn't in their starting lineup. I thought that was interesting because he's probably their best defensive back, but they felt pretty confident in the way they had things structured. Um, I would look for him. That just doesn't. It just doesn't add up, does it? Uh, I would look for him to play a much bigger role against Florida, obviously on Saturday, and probably shift some things around. Maybe allow you to move snacks back in to nickel, uh, have Braxton and and McLaughlin at the corners with Singletary rotating in, Keon Stewart maybe rotating in some, and then you've got you know Hudson and uh, really they've been rotating that other spot with uh, Jaden Johnson and um, and Alfaheem Walcott, and you know. Malik Chavis has gotten some action as well. All right. What's next? Up to upcoming recruiting dates. So Danny West has broken this down. We'll go over a little bit here. But uh, now through November 27th, we're still in the evaluation period. So coaches can get out on the road and watch games and stuff like that. You're not going to see Arkansas do that this weekend in Florida. In fact, as we talked with Danny last week, there's only five or six players on the whole roster from the state of Florida, including walk-ons. So hasn't been a state that Arkansas has hit as heavily. Lately been more Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and, and states like that. So, hasn't been a state that Arkansas has hit heavily, but um, November 28th through the 1st is a dead period, so a short little dead period, and then the contact period, December 2nd through 17th. So, that means coaches can go out and do, like, in-home visits and stuff and, and visit recruits in their school and stuff like that. They get six uh, in-home visits with prospects. So, uh, that's when that will start up. And then um, you got the transfer window starting December 4th through January 2nd. That's a big deal. It's going to be something to watch. That's, uh, I guess, the weekend right right after the championship game. So uh, that's big. If you want to read all the all the breakdown on all the calendars, when you know signing days are, when the dead periods are, and stuff, you can go to Hog Sports H A W G Sports dot com. Danny's got it broken down all the way through February seventh. So the first Wednesday um, in February this year is on the seventh. That's when signing day always is. All right. Arkansas basketball plays Monday, November 6th. That's the next game against Alcorn State. State I should say that's the first game. It feels like the Purdue game was the first game, but that was just a charity exhibition. Doesn't count on the record. So you've got Alcorn State, and then Friday, November 10th, Gardner-Webb. Then Monday, November 13th, Old Dominion. And then Friday, November 17th, UNC Greensboro. And then uh, just a little break till Wednesday, November 22nd, when they'll face Stanford in the Bahamas for the Bad Boy Mowers Battle for Atlantis. And then they play Michigan or Memphis on Thursday, November 23rd. That that Stanford game on Wednesday is at 6.30 p.m. That will be on ESPNU. Uh, the Michigan or Memphis game will be 1.30 or 6.30 uh, on ESPN or ESPNU. That's Thursday, uh, the 23rd. And then Friday, November 24th is a to-be-determined opponent. That will be on ESPN, ESPN2, or ESPNU to be determined on – uh, the opponent and the time, but we do know it'll be November 24th. And then, of course, right around to Duke, November 29th. So come back five days later, you're playing the Duke Blue Devils at 8.15 on ESPN. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? It's a great, great basketball schedule. Then you get Furman December 4th, Oklahoma December 9th, Lipscomb, Abilene Christian, UNC Wilmington, and then – Guys, it's time for SEC play. Saturday, January 6th, you get Auburn. Glad they quit doing the uh, – remember they would – for a while they did the December conference game. You'd have like one conference game in December. I'm glad they quit doing that. Just bunch it all together. And that's it. That's where we're going. They got a great team to play this schedule. All right, let's hop over to Curtis Wilkerson. For those of you who don't follow Curtis, you can follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. Why is he underscore? Because somebody else took the name, I guess. <laughs> at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. He's the Hog Sports Senior Analyst. Does a great job. Really focusing a lot on basketball, but does just about everything for us. I mean, just like most of the guys at Hog Sports, does a little bit of everything. If I can find him, we can talk to him.
Again, follow Curtis at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. Does a lot of great content, free and Thanks, VIP. Rick. How you doing, Curtis? Man, it's it's basketball season. Like, there's enough uh, weird stuff going on with this two and six football team for it to be interesting. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm doing great. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good time to be covering the Hogs, I guess. Even though uh, it has been a little bit of a negative news cycle with football, but man, basketball just looks like it's it's really taken off. Your thoughts, real quick, on this uh, on this game coming up with Alcorn State. Yeah, I mean, it should be, you know, on, on the surface, just kind of your typical season opener, you know, kind of a, a tune-up game. They've got this four-game sample size, really, uh, where they should take care of business before they go to the Bahamas and it, and it gets real. But Alcorn State's probably a little bit better, I, I think, than people give them credit for. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see the name, you think about a swag team, and you go back to a couple of years ago and they opened against Mississippi Valley State and beat them by like 100 uh, but this team's pretty good. I mean, they they won the regular season title on the SWAG a couple years in a row. Uh, I think they were 15-3 and three in their league last year. They probably should have made it to the NCAA tournament. They got upset uh, in their conference tournament, and they're, they're projected as a team that could win the league again. So uh, not bad, you know, for a, a mid-major program. They rebounded well. They've got some shooters. So, uh, you know, obviously a game that Arkansas should, should handle their business in, but, you know, it won't be – uh, maybe the cakewalk that we've seen in years past. I, I, I would imagine whatever the spread is, you can go with Arkansas to cover it, but maybe a little more competitive than you would think. You can always depend on Curtis Wilkerson for reliable basketball coverage, and you can always depend on Ozarks Go for reliable internet service. If you're interested in upgrading your internet service, go check out our friends at ozarksgo.net slash hog. That's H-A-W-G. You can also reach them at 479-684-4900, and you're going to talk to somebody local who may want to talk the Razorbacks with you knows what's going on in this area it is a local company you're not going to get shipped off to some call center they offer several different tiers of internet multi-gig is what I use they also use gigabit which is a thousand megabits per second I think it's great for most families several different tiers one low price they're not going to jack you up next year either and the selling point I always say with Ozarks Go is I've literally I talked to somebody the other day Curtis and he said um, he's with another company. He said, yeah, they just tell you, you know, every few weeks, just unplug the router and plug it back in. Just, you know, make sure to do that every few weeks. I've never unplugged and replugged my router with Ozarks Go because it's always worked. I've had 100% uptime. So uh, go check out our friends at Ozarks Go, ozarksgo.net slash hog, 479-684-4900. All right, back to you, Curtis. We, uh, we need to talk a little bit of uh, this Florida game, obviously. One of the many yeah. things you cover, we we still have you doing five questions, or excuse me, still have you doing um, uh, keys to victory and uh, and uh, five burning questions, even though the keys to victory just have not been accomplished week after week. Yeah, it kind of feels that way. Well, first of all, what a transition in the Ozarks Go thing there. That was that was well. You like done. that? I give you props for that. That was good. That I was try well I, I try to sneak it in where I can, I mix it up <laughs> yeah. a little bit, doing it in your segment this time. I like it. I like it. But no, I mean, you're hundred percent right. I mean, it feels like every week, you know, we've got these, uh, these keys to victory and, and the burning questions and, and, you know, the keys are, are never really accomplished mm-hmm. and the burning questions are not the answers that, that maybe Arkansas fans are looking for. Yeah. Um, I will say, Hey, it, it was a lot more of an enjoyable right this week just because of some of the changes, you know, what's this yeah. going to look like with Kenny Guyton and, uh, does it kind of spark some, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a pulse on the, on the offensive side of the ball. So a few different things to look at, but yeah, hopefully, uh, it'll be a little bit more entertaining to to write about and for people to read about in the aftermath. My my experience, whenever a coach says, like, uh, we're going to simplify things, it's just like the beginning of the end. I mean, that's (laughs) – it has just been the beginning of the end. Now, you're – the five keys to – or excuse me, the five – yeah, keys to victory are always the same. Penalties, turnovers, special teams. Injuries could be a big one in this one. We're talking about Rocket Sanders, Devon Manuel, and – uh, you know, Dwight McLaughlin. Uh The fifth is always, uh, you know, your choice, and you pick uh, don't overthink it this time. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of a really a worse look than after the Mississippi State game when, yeah. you know, Sam Pittman says he didn't know what to do with, you know, Cam Little and field goal range. They get hit with that delay game. Uh, you know, that can't happen. I, I appreciate the honesty. Don't get me wrong. I probably would have kept that one to myself. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it seems like there's just been some game management issues this season and, and more decisions that have, have gone wrong than right. Uh, you know, the pressure is only growing, really, with, with every week that passes here. Uh, you know, maybe Sam needs to, to take a page out of his own playbook there and, and simplify things in terms of that decision making. But aside from that, you know, Kenny Guyton, too. I mean, I'm sure they're doing everything they can to – 
you know, have him fully prepared for his play calling debut, but it, it, it's just going to hit different in the moment, in the swamp, when things go off script. Uh, and it's your first time, you know, it, with the bullets flying live there. So it, to me, like if it was my debut, I'd, I'm sure I'd be trying to be too perfect or, or creative or savvy or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important for Kenny Guyton to be confident and decisive in everything that he's doing. You know, if, if you're trying to play faster, it starts with getting the calls in quick and, and getting to it. You know, if you're unsure, changing your mind or, or slower to the punch or whatever, uh, the guys are going to sense that, right? And, it, you know, I think teams kind of take on the identity of their coach. Uh, so I'm fascinated to see how it goes. And, and quite frankly, you know, we can guess all we want to, but we're just really not going to know. And, and neither is, is Kenny Guyton, neither is Sam Pittman until they get out there and do it. So it's uh, it adds a lot of intrigue to this one for sure. I mean, it's either going to be really good or it's going to be like, a disaster, I guess. A look, like just yeah. like look like a guy calling his very first, you know, game. So, uh, one of two ways. So, and that's kind of you know your first uh, burning question. You know, can Kenny Guyton kick start, start the Arkansas offense? I think you kind of um, address that. But do you do you think the change will suit KJ? You you feel like um, he's going to be? I mean, you should be motivated for every game. But man, he did not look motivated in the last game. No, he, he didn't at all, and I, I think it could, and, and I definitely hope it does. You know, if they're really, uh, you know, doing the things that they say they're doing in terms of, of you know, simplifying the playbook and, um, hey, we practice, you know, moving the pocket, maybe we're going to actually go out there and do it on Saturday now. If they're going to do all these things, yeah, I, I think it could help KJ. You know, when he's, uh, you know, in a situation where he doesn't have to overthink things, he can just kind of go out there and play and, and react to what's going on. Uh, you know, his ability to, to improvise and, and move and, you know, kind of make something out of nothing, that's what makes him a special quarterback. Mm-hmm. So if they're putting him in position to, to do those things and, you know, as opposed to trying to make him a pocket passer or whatever they were doing the, the last few weeks there, then, yeah, I think it definitely could help him out. And, you know, he's kind of the uh, – I mean, he's the engine for the – it's not kind of, he is. He's the engine for the offense, even with the, you know, O-line struggling or, or whatever. You know, he's a guy that can put you on, on the back – or you know, he can put the team on his back and kind of carry you to a win, uh, especially on the road. Uh, they've got to get over this sump pump somehow, and I just don't think they're going to do it unless you get the K.J. Jefferson of uh, maybe the past couple of years as opposed to the one that we've seen here the last few weeks. Curtis Wilkerson joining us. Again, you can follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore on Twitter, Hogsports Senior Analyst. Uh, a lot of the content he does is VIP, so come check us out at Hogsports for just $1 for your first month. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Um, Gators, a get-right game for Razorback offensive line with a question mark. And, you know, I'll take you back to the press conference on Wednesday we have with Sam Pittman. I thought Tom Murphy asked um, – it's not so much that it was an interesting question, it's just the response was really interesting because he just asked about communication uh, with the offensive line, uh, getting the protections right. That was one of the problems with, you know, that led to Enos's firing. And Pittman basically did kind of like, I don't want to talk about it anymore. You know, so I thought that was a really kind of telling response, a non-answer. Uh, and Pittman went on to say, you know, the question's fine. It's just like I'm, you know, tired of talking about it. And that's kind of one of the things I think that with K.J., and people, people who don't know, I think, think that like a hurry up, no huddle spread offense is more complex, and really it's it's just simpler. And it, it's there's window dressing and stuff, but everything's simpler. These pro style offenses take a lot more time to learn. Sometimes you have to develop quarterbacks in the system um, versus a spread. You like a lot of times you see a freshman quarterback come in and just take up take the reins of an offense. But a pro style you don't see that as much. And KJ has never been in that kind of offense. And you know I guess maybe we just assume him being an older player, he just jump right into it, and that that hasn't been the case. But uh, for the offensive line, this ought to be a simpler game plan for them, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, you, you would definitely think so for, for a lot of the reasons you laid out there. So, uh, you know, hopefully it's a it's a situation where, uh, you know, maybe having a scaled down playbook and, and moving a little bit faster, all those things uh, could help them be a little bit more successful. And, and then if you look, you know, across the ball, uh, I mean, it hasn't really mattered who the who the opponent has been throughout mm-hmm. the course of the year here. But, I mean, if you take a look at Florida, um, I think they rank last in the conference in, in total sacks and, and maybe next to last with, uh, you know, in tackles for loss. So, you know, in terms of matchups going down the stretch here, I'd probably FIU as the exception there. This might be their most favorable matchup, you know, in, in the trenches there. So, uh, yeah, combining everything, uh, you know, maybe this is a, an opportunity. Uh, look, I don't I – don't, I'm not going to say that Arkansas is just going to turn around and all of a sudden just be a dominant offensive line, but you know, maybe they can make some progress there. And uh, again, just like with KJ, just being in a system that's more conducive to, 
uh, I don't know, just just maybe kind of showing their strengths as opposed to just hanging them out to dry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the things they were doing just wasn't working, man. And, and so hopefully uh, for their sake, they can, you know, kind of get things going here down the stretch. You know, flipping it to the other side of the ball, Curtis, with – uh, the Florida offensive line, it's not a, just a highly experienced offensive line. They've, they've got a, a decent number of starts between them, but especially the center, who's, who's been kind of banged up. He only has three starts this year because of injuries. But when I was breaking down, looking at their personnel, you know there's not a single composite four-star offensive lineman up front for, for Florida? And really? Yeah, wow. I, I found that interesting for a team like Florida. Now they have some some guys who are ranked four star on on various sites, but as far as the composite rankings, there's not a single four star in that group. What do you think, Arkansas defense? Do you think they could feast on that offensive line? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm bought in on this defense right now, I and mean, they've been they've been really really good the last few weeks. And uh, you know, it's impressive to me. Like when the, you know when the offense has been struggling as much as it is, like these guys just don't give up on the other side of the ball. It's been crazy. Uh, you know, I go back to that Mississippi State game, uh, you know, where Arkansas stalls out and there's what just a little over two minutes left or whatever. Uh, and they come up with a stop and they get the missed field goal and get the ball back. I mean, it would have been easy at that point to just be like, hey, man, what, we had our shot. It's just not <laughs> not our day here. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's pack it up and get back to the house. But those guys are relentless, man. Travis Williams really has them playing some good football. They, you know, they should be healthy. Uh, they're definitely bought in despite the struggles that the team's having. So, uh, yeah, I have no doubt they can go down there and, and play well and, and keep Arkansas, you know, within striking distance. Just hopefully, and I, I think this is one of the keys last week, just play, or two weeks ago, is just playing complimentary football. Like, can the offense help them out a little bit here? And I, I do wonder, uh, you know, if Arkansas is going to be picking up the tempo offensively, playing at a faster pace, you know, how does that impact things on the other side of the ball? Uh, but it seems like they've got some pretty good depth, you know, across the board there. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to go down there and have a good showing in the swap. All right, last question for you, Curtis. Sam Pittman talked about this, getting the respect back of the fans inside the state. I thought he put that a great way. we got to get our respect back inside the state. But yeah. um, what do you think? How do you see it playing out? You think Arkansas gets their respect back in this one? Yeah, I, I think they definitely can. I, but that doesn't have to equal a win, you know. In, in my opinion, you know, they can they can take some steps forward without going and doing something they haven't done before and in, in, in winning in the swamp. You know, in my eyes, Florida's very beatable, even at home. They're not a bad team, but they're not anything special either. I just, you know, at the end of the day, I'm I'm intrigued to see how this goes. Uh, but I'm I'm still kind of out on this Arkansas team right I now. I mean, don't get me don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, I'm still you know I'm, I'm hanging out in the water. Like, I'm nibbling around the hook. I'm I'm looking for a reason to bite. Right. You were the I only person on our head. team who predicted Mississippi State to beat Arkansas last week I know, or two weeks I ago. Know. And, <laughs> and I'm sticking and I'm sticking to it. Like, I I I want to be positive about it. I want to be optimistic. Like, please hook me and reel me back in. Mm-hmm. But until we see this offense show a pulse and, and until we see something, you know, different, I, I'm, I'm picking Arkansas to lose a one-score game. I mean, it's just what they do. So yeah. that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this goes with, with Kenny Guyton and if this is a rejuvenated group coming out of the bye week. But, you know, until they get over the hump, I, I can't predict them to do it. I just can't. <laughs> All right. Good stuff, Curtis. <laughs> Appreciate you, brother. Yep, anytime. All right, everybody. That's Kurt Wilkerson again. Follow Curtis at Kurt Wilkerson underscore – uh, he's the Hog Sports senior analyst, and like I said, as you can see, does a great job for us at Hog Sports. All right, we're going to go to Jacob Rudner now. Jacob is with Swamp Twenty Four Seven, part of the Twenty Four Seven Sports Network, and this is his first time on with us. So we'll see what Jacob has to say. Give us a little bit of insight on the Florida Gators. Jacob, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great over here in Arkansas. Um, how's the weather down there in Florida? What kind of game are we expecting on Saturday, weather-wise? And the wet, yeah, the, the weather's a little chilly, actually. I woke up this morning in the in the 40s, which is a, a little bit of a change of pace mm-hmm. around here. But I would imagine by game time on Saturday, it'll be a little warmer around noon, probably in the mid-70s. Gotcha. Well, I just wanted to kind of jump in with, uh, you know, kind of the things we've been talking about in the past, just uh, like the injury situation with Florida. If you could fill us in with, with what's going on there. How do, how do they look uh, heading into this Arkansas game? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with the, the very big news from last night, which is that Florida's starting middle linebacker, Shamar James, a true sophomore, leading tackler for the team this season, will be out not only for this game, but for the remainder of the season. 
Uh, he suffered a dislocated kneecap uh, in the fourth quarter against Georgia and underwent surgery yesterday, so that's it. He's done mm-hmm. till the spring. Uh, Florida's offensive line has been a little bit beat up so far this season, but it sounds like it might have its full-strength unit against Arkansas. Center Kingsley Egwakan has been somebody who's been mm-hmm. – uh, you know, in and out of games due to an ankle injury, but he wasn't listed with a designation uh, yesterday when Florida released its depth chart. The only other guys who I would keep an eye on from an injury standpoint are defensive linemen Tyreek Sapp and Cam Jackson. They were listed as questionable with injuries that are pretty much unknown. They give us general descriptions of what's going on, and we don't really get much of a status update from Billy Napier other than the fact that it's unclear if they'll play. And that would be a a pretty big deal if they don't. Uh, But they were listed as questionable, not out. You know, when Graham Mertz committed out of the transfer portal from Wisconsin to Florida, I was just thinking, Graham Mertz, really? This is your replacement for Anthony Richardson? I mean, he's at best like a 135 efficiency rating. He's like at 165 or something now with Florida. He's passed for 2,100 yards, 14 touchdowns, two interceptions, 75.9% completion percentage. What can, you, what can you tell us about him? Like, how, What has been the difference with him from his time at Wisconsin to this jump he's made at Florida? Yeah, well, well I'll start with Sly saying this. Props to Florida's staff, which essentially from the jump after Graham Mertz's commitment had been saying, we think that this guy might not have been used in the best way possible given his skill set at Wisconsin. We see ways in which we're going to be able to bring some of the better qualities out of him that we hadn't really seen over the last four years when he was in the Big Ten. And they've delivered. They've, they've definitely done that. Uh, he is a very efficient quarterback in the short to intermediate ranges. He does an excellent job of scanning the field, getting the ball out quickly, uh, and, and most impressively, in my opinion, standing in the pocket even when pressure gets home a little bit. Uh, this is a guy who's been really tough. Teams can knock him down and, and, and you know essentially look like they've hurt him, but he tends to just get right back up and move on to the next play. Uh, and that willingness to just, you know, you know, make contact and get through your progression to get the ball out and, and find the best option has allowed him to have such a high completion percentage and efficiency rating. This is a guy uh, who is extremely in tune with the game, meaning he is a film, you know, monster. He gets praised almost on a weekly basis by Billy Napier for being that kind of quarterback who's in the facility all the time and putting in the extra work to watch film and understand the scheme. Uh, and, and do what is that necessary to essentially operate this offense for Florida. Uh, and, and and he's delivered in that way. And Florida really knew this all along. Jacob Rudner joining us. Again, you can follow him at Jacob Rudner to any Florida fans out there listening. Um, and you can go check him out at Swamp 24-7, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. Does a great job over there covering the Florida Gators with the team over there. Now, you want us to look out for a guy, Eugene Wilson, who was just outside the top 100 as a recruit, probably one of the top freshmen uh, in the country right now with like 37 receptions. Uh, but Florida's got a lot of weapons in the backfield with Trevor Etienne, um, uh, Montreal Johnson, and then a wide receiver with Ricky – is it Pearsall? Is that how you say it? Yeah, Pearsall. Yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the skill guys for Florida. Sure. I, well, I'll actually, I'll start with Eugene Wilson just because I, I really have been impressed by him lately. Like you said, outside the top 100 as a prospect, I would argue knowing what we've seen now through eight games probably should a little bit been a little bit higher in those rankings. Uh, Florida has done a great job of utilizing him in unique ways, meaning that they'll align him in the backfield sometimes just to give defenses different looks and capitalize on his speed. They've realized a lot of matchup advantages with Wilson out of the backfield, uh, getting him going against safeties who have to really come down the field fast and hard in order to be able to cover him adequately or linebackers who he's simply faster than. And if he's not in the backfield, they do send him in motion pre-snap quite a bit to get him open. And with his skill set, both as a route runner, pass catcher, but really his speed, uh, he's been a weapon. Florida's been able to target him more than any other receiver in its most recent outings, including against Georgia when he caught 11 passes. Uh, and so this is a kid who defenses simply have to be aware of. Kirby Smart said as much throughout the week leading up to last week's game. And so, uh, to me, the offense is going to start to really revolve around him. And if I'm Arkansas, I'm immediately keying in on three when I get out there on the field. I need to know where he's at at all times. Uh, that being said, there are other weapons. Ricky Pearsall has been Florida's leading receiver in every category so far this season. He's tracking towards 1,000 yards. Would be the first Florida player to do that since 2002. Uh, he is a guy who has sure hands, good route runner, 
will mostly line up in the slot for Florida uh, and does a really good job of just creating mismatches and utilizing his speed as well uh, to his advantage, especially when he draws a bigger safety or you know a nickel corner who might not be the, the, the greatest in coverage in those intermediate ranges when he can use his shiftiness to create some space. Uh, running backs are kind of an interesting story so far this year. Florida does have explosive run potential. We learned that last year with both Montreal Johnson and Trevor Etienne. This season, the explosiveness hasn't really been there consistently. I'm not so sure that's the fault of the running back so much as it is an offensive line that hasn't really mm. provided the same blocking as it did last year. Uh, and Florida's been rather unimpressive on the ground. It's only running the ball 45% of the time, which is basically 10% less than it did last year. And it's only averaging 3.9 yards per pop. So uh, this is a unit that, that hasn't really gotten it going. I would still be wary of the explosiveness just because they are two good running backs, but it's not the threat that it was last year. Yeah, you don't think their running game has gotten it going. You see what Arkansas has got going this year after being one of the top rushing teams in the country the last few years, and now it's uh, they just can't seem to get anything, but may get Rocket Sanders back. Um, and speaking of that matchup, Florida's defense hasn't been spectacular. You mentioned a, a big injury with Shamar James uh, at middle linebacker. Not a team that produces a lot of sacks. How do you see this matchup going? It, this is going to be really interesting because in this matchup, I'm not so sure it's about sacks as much as it is about contain. K.J. Jefferson presents that threat with his legs, as you guys all know. Uh, and, and Florida hasn't consistently done a great job containing guys like that. This dates back to last year. We haven't seen Florida really handle mobile quarterbacks in the way necessary to consistently secure wins. A additionally, this is a defensive unit that has not defended the deep pass as well. Beyond 15 yards has been a real struggle. Jalen Kimber, uh, you know, I mentioned in the, in the Q&A with you guys that Jalen Kimber has been a guy recently who's really struggled. And, and opposing offenses know it. They're targeting him, and they're doing so successfully. Uh, and so these are kind of the things that I would be looking for if I'm Arkansas. Am I able to get guys open down the field uh, maybe via play action to get K.J. Jefferson out of the pocket, force Florida to have to worry about him as a runner just as much as it has to worry about him with his arm. I'll be trying to take advantage of the linebacker play that's going to have to occur for Florida without its top, clear, best linebacker. Uh, mm -hmm. This could be a more challenging game for this Florida defense than I think people are maybe giving it credit for because I think the records can be a little bit distracting between these two teams. But the reality is that this is kind of the exact offense that Florida has problems with. A quarterback who can get out of the pocket comfortably, he's a tough quarterback, got a good enough arm, and if you can get weapons open down the field, it really could turn the table here. I'm kind of bouncing around here, but I, I meant to ask you about Florida's offensive line situation with Rob Sale being an offensive coordinator and offensive line coach, and there's another offensive line coach. You don't see that. Sam Pittman said he used to see that back in the 90s and stuff, but I'll tell you another interesting dynamic with him and Sale is Sale was the offensive line coach at Georgia with under Mark Rick's staff when they were fired, and then uh, Kirby Smart came in with Sam Pittman, and Sam Pittman took over that offensive line. They actually became friends after that and you know handled things professionally, but I was just curious about the dynamic with you know who coaches what on the offensive line and the meetings, how that stuff is structured, if you know any of that. Yeah, of course. Florida does divide up the unit inside and outside guys primarily. That's not always how they divide things up. It kind of changes based on practice. They've gone right side versus left side. Uh, Darnell Stapleton, you know, Florida's other offensive line coach, has at times taken the centers. Rob Sale has at times taken the centers and vice versa. Uh, and so they do mix and match. I think the benefit that Florida thinks it realizes from doing this is that it can get some more focused attention to its offensive linemen. You know, you, you break the, gr the group up into two, and then you don't have to divide your attention as a coach too thin, uh, you know, amongst your offensive linemen. And, and, and they both have different experiences, too. Stapleton was a player, played as high as the NFL as a Super Bowl champion. Rob Sale is a longtime offensive line coach, and he comes from that coaching background, uh, played at LSU as a center. And so, you know, there's a dynamic that I think both these guys really make work. I think it's also a benefit to recruiting, which is partially why they do that. Uh, but, but yes, to answer your question, they, they divide it kind of dependent on practice, but for the most part, they'll divide inside and outside. Jacob, we'll get you out with this. Just how do you see this game playing out? Arkansas was six and a half point favorites. The line I've seen latest has jumped down as, as – or excuse me, Arkansas was six and a half point underdogs, but latest I've seen Arkansas is uh, now five and a half point underdogs. 
How do you see this one playing out in Florida? Obviously, a big game for both coaches. Absolutely. I think that the line, first of all, is is in the right place. Uh, Arkansas has shown the ability to play close games, even if it loses, especially on the road against the SEC. 4.3 points uh, per loss in terms of deficit. I could see this being really similar. I think that this comes down to which defense is able to generate a stop or two, get possession it, it back into your team's hands, and, and offense has to capitalize. But I do think that this will be on the higher scoring end. Uh, my prediction, I'm going 31-27 Gators. I do think they're able to get it done at home. Florida's a much better home team than it is on the road. Uh, and this is a must-win game. So, yeah, I, I, I do think that Florida survives an offensive shootout-style game, but it's going to be real close. All right, Jacob. Well, man, we really appreciate you coming on. Thought you did a great job. And uh, I guess uh, we'll see what happens on Saturday. I appreciate you having me and uh, looking forward to seeing you in Gainesville. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. That's Jacob Rudner. Does a great job over there with Swamp 24-7. I won't be making, actually, the trip to Gainesville this year for obvious reasons. It hasn't been the football season we've all wanted, but uh, I'll be walking around um, parts unknown, undisclosed location type of deal. Hey, one more time, I wanted to tell you about our friends at Ozarks Go. If you haven't, or if you're disappointed with your internet or uh, maybe you don't have internet service, think if you're in northwest Arkansas, think like north of the tunnel, um, you know, parts of Missouri, Oklahoma. If you get Ozarks Electric, then you most likely have access to Ozarks Go. They're ever expanding. Just recently got in Rogers, uh, but expanding all over Fayetteville and northwest Arkansas. Go check them out. I've used them for two and a half years. I actually um, have used several. I've used one, two, three, at least three other internet service providers uh, since I've been in northwest Arkansas. And... Um, when I moved this last time, I was like, I'm going to try somebody else. I wasn't satisfied with my other provider. Went with Ozarks Go. Uh, then they reached out to me not long after that, and I said, you know what? I already use you guys. They're fantastic. I've been super pleased with the service. I'd be happy to uh, have you guys as our title sponsor. So uh, go check them out, ozarksgo.net slash hog. If you're interested in upgrading your Internet service, uh, disappointed with what you have right now, or just curious if there's anything out there better, because I can assure you, based on my experience, there is. Um, you know, we don't get in arguments in my house about the internet's not working or uh, bandwidth issues or anything like that. It just works at Ozarks Go. Uh, 479-684-4900 if you want to give them a call. Uh, several different tiers. I use the multi-gig, which is 2,500 megabits per second, lightning fast. Gigabit, I think, is good for most families. If you use a ton of internet like I do, uh, then maybe you want to explore the multi-gig. So one one great price. Not going to jack your rates up in year two. Ozarksgo.net slash hog. I think we covered pretty much most of the stuff you wanted to we wanted to talk about um yeah i think so let's see uh if you guys got any good questions here trey andrews says arkansas pulls the upset kathy wilson is spamming us with small business grants over and over and over again Jake Belk says, Trey, please address your feeling about Sam's comments about Singleton maybe playing on special teams. Why would you risk injury for him? Basically nothing. I think that's interesting too. Like where you where would you put now? He's fast. Like he's like they talk about him maybe, you know, being twenty three mile an hour club one day. Like he's real fast. Uh he's a big body, but I don't know why you would just throw him out there on special teams. That's a great question. I don't understand why you would do that with your quarterback. Your, I mean, he's your third-string quarterback, but I don't know. Maybe they want to see him, what he looks like with the ball, and he's like, I don't know. I don't. Would you use him as a return guy? Why would you use him as a return guy when you got Isaiah Satania? What capacity could we see Malachi Singleton out there? I don't, I don't know, but I guess we'll be watching to see if he ever's out there. That's a good question and something that I'm confused about as well. Austin Kiefer says, what happens after a four-win season? Is Pittman given one more year? Four wins, man, they they go one and two in these last conference games and beat FIU. I mean, four is tough. Like, thing is, like, I don't know. I just don't – it's hard to say until you're just, like, sitting in it. Like, does four wins mean they close the season out getting routed at home by Missouri, you know? Or do they play Missouri close? Or is Missouri the team that they beat, you know? If, if they go into the Missouri game – and he hasn't won, but FIU is it already decided before the Missouri game? You know, I think about like Brett Bielema 
when he was fired. And, you know, they had the press conference set up after the Missouri game. Like, it didn't matter if he was winning that Missouri game or not. He was gone. Like, no matter what. Because they had everything set up. Like, we didn't even really focus on the post-game Missouri because we were immediately notified that he had been fired and that there would be a press conference immediately following. You know, so um, – I always wonder, like, if he'd won that game, did they do the press conference right after? I don't know. But anyway, I don't I don't know. It, until you're just sitting in it and, like, you experience the losses, it's just hard to project that. So, I've said before I think the best thing for Arkansas is for Sam to – is to pull for Sam Pittman to, you know, pull this thing out and, and, um, and get another year. And by pull that out, I mean, like, win the rest of these games at least win three of them. Like, I can understand a loss at Florida. It's a tough place to play. But beat Auburn at home, beat FIU, beat Missouri, finish on a three-game winning streak. And when you're sitting in that, I think maybe people would feel different about it than they do right now. It's just, it's just hard to say, you know. Um, but obviously, three and nine is an ugly record in year four. And it's hard to keep. It just is. Everybody, you know, what I hear from everybody, I really like Sam. I want him to succeed, but it's just not working. You know, that's what most fans that I talk to say. It's just not working. It's not like I want to keep it. I mean, like most fans I talk to kind of talk about a, ch- a coaching change. So, we'll see. Um, Dalton Adams says something I will give Sam for addressing is how slow the entire offense moved and how they've worked on speeding everything up from quarterback, running back, exchange all the way up to tempo. We'll see how it works. I mean, that's another thing, like – does this offense finally get going? Like, we can talk about wins and losses and stuff, but, like, does the offense finally look competent again? Like, okay, Danny knows was a big problem. Like, if it's that, then maybe our thoughts on things change. You know, there have been some, you know, concerns over uh, in-game management, whether it's, um, you know, that, well, penalties, first of all, have been an issue. But I think that's, you know, maybe that's attributed to the some of the things they're asked to do on offense. But, um, you know, some of the – like the decision on, you know, calling a timeout to punt – uh, instead of kicking the field goal last game or, you know, when they'll call timeout before fourth and one and come out and punt the ball instead of, like, you know, coming up and doing a hard count. You know, those kinds of things. When you're talking about losing a lot of close games, you're like, okay, what were some of the things from a decision-making standpoint that could have been improved? And that's, you know, why a lot of that's come under fire also. Chris Archer says, as much as I love the Hogs, I just don't see us winning this game. Maybe if Pittman had a, made a change sooner in the season – I just think it's time for a change to head coach because it's only going to get harder with Texas and Oklahoma coming in next year um, to get a pre- – you know what I think is interesting? Like Arkansas could be – like if, if things go awry and – you know, or continue to go awry, right? Uh, if they continue that direction, then, you know, Arkansas – you know, Shane Beamer's obviously not setting the world on fire. Jimbo Fisher's under fire also for – and could be fired too, I guess. But – it's possible that Arkansas is the only job opening in the SEC. And I've said this before. Some people disagree because, you know, they pointed to TCU making a quick turnaround with Sonny Dykes coming in just one year. But uh, I I do think it will be a struggle for Arkansas uh, if Sam Pittman is let go just because the attrition you'll have. He's a very popular coach among the players and stuff. You will experience a lot of attrition. You thought last year was a lot. This year you'd really lose some good players. And, um, you know, you lose the defensive staff and – the recruiting class is going to take a major hit, all those kinds of things. It's just not ideal to keep changing coaches if you can avoid it, but sometimes you you just don't have any choice. So, um, yeah, the new SEC, the schedule shapes up nicer, doesn't it? You know, you don't play Alabama or Georgia, you get Texas here. Uh, the schedule sh- – it would be nice to have a little continuity with the program entering this new era of the SEC. At the same time, you just can't sit there and say, three and nine's fine, that's an acceptable year four record for Arkansas football. And you have to gauge how things are in the offseason if you accept that, you know. How toxic is it? Stephen Miller says, let's see what Kenny G can do. That's all we can do. Yeah. Brian Malone says, curious to see if the offense, what the offense looks like this week. Who is out there if we move on from Sam? Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of names that have been brought up. Obviously, you know, Elko. Um, I've seen uh, Rhett Lashley brought up. Um, uh uh, Jeff Trailer over at UTSA, um, Jamie Chadwell at um, at Liberty. You know, there's a lot of names that get thrown around out there. Um, Leopold at uh, Kansas. Josh Lyles says, 
with this season being kind of a worst case scenario outcome as far as KG's draft stock, do you see him returning for another year? I don't think he. I've, I've heard him say, like on a radio interview, his first interview after um, Enos was fired, that, you know, talking about, you know, having a disappointing season in his senior year, kind of referring to it like almost like it's his last year. He does have the option to return. But. I, I kind of think like sometimes players just get in their head that like it's time for me to take the next step. And he's been in college for five years. You know, he's not a fourth year senior. He's a fifth year senior. Um, I remember after his sophomore year, he was talking like, yeah, I think I need another year. And now he's been there two years. So, you know, I, I point to Jaden Hazelwood a lot of times, like, you know, he entered the season uh, thinking, you know, I'm gone after this year. And even though he probably should have returned, he still left. And I kind of think that's what KG will do. And last one, Cedric White says, "Do does Hunter Uretake take into account the programs next year? Florida and Texas A&M may be open. Oh, Texas A&M may be open. Um, I, I mean, I think you have to look at that. Like Florida could – like if Arkansas beats Florida, like Billy Napier could be in serious trouble, you know. It's – when you consider the, the three-game stretch that he has after Arkansas – at LSU, at Missouri, and then at home against Florida State. You know, not being bowl eligible. By Florida standard, that's probably a fireable season. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right, everybody, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank uh, Jacob Rudner from Swamp 24-7 for hopping on. Of course, Curtis, Curtis Wilkerson for all the insight he brings to the show. And all of you for your questions, your viewership. Ozarks Go, our title sponsor. Um yeah, just appreciate everybody for helping make the show popular. If you haven't taken a moment to throw us that five-star review, like I said, we're almost at 1,000 ratings. I'd love to get there before football season ends. I don't I don't know if we will or not, but we can with your help. So give us a five-star review. Show show your pappy the show. Uh, he doesn't have internet. He doesn't know. He, doesn't, he has a flip phone. He doesn't know about the show. So uh, let him see the show. I'm sure he'll enjoy it. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. This has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, and we'll catch you next time. Where are we going? I'll throw a Keith Grayson out graphic up there randomly. Thanks for watching, everybody.